Welcome to yet another special broadcast uh, in tribute and celebration of the life and times of the late great statesman, uh, Dr. Hage G. Kengo. The late president, uh, Dr. Hage Kengo, embarked on a diplomatic visit to the UK in 1992, and at the time he was the Prime Minister in addressing the Confederation of British Industry at Centre Point. In his speech to the CBI in 1992, Dr. Hage Kengo discusses his country's recent successful transition to an independent democratic state and of course expounds upon how the new country is healing after the bitter Namibia War of Independence, also known as the South African Border War. Aga Kengup then to an audience of a major British businessmen, explains Namibia's future goals for economic development and challenges that need to be overcome to achieve them. Let's take a look at this insert courtesy of Journeyman Pictures as it sets the tone for our focus for today's program. The focus is on economics and investments for the future of Namibia in Kengup's eyes. It's a nation that rose from the world's oldest desert, where vast red dunes in southern Africa meet the Atlantic Ocean. Namibia has a long history of struggling for liberation. The Portuguese first explored it in the 1400s, Germany ruled it in the late 1800s, and South Africa seized it during World War I under a League of Nations mandate. The Republic of Namibia gained independence in 1990 after more than 20 years of war. According to the World Bank, progress towards reaching inequality has been slow, and Namibia remains one of the world's most unequal countries. Yet that could change given the recent discovery of an estimated 1 billion barrels of oil off its coast. But could oil prove more of a curse than a blessing? We will find out as Namibia's president, Hage Gengub, talks to Al Jazeera. President Hage Gengob, President of the Republic of Namibia, thank you very much for talking to Al Jazeera. Namibia recently struck oil off the coast of the country, something that's expected to bring billions in investments and is sort of a game changer, according to many people. How excited are you? The discovery of oil, the green hydrogen issues are now making Namibia to be on the top shelf of the world. I was in Brussels, I had to see everybody, literally, nearly every leader, you know, the king, the prime minister, that. So that's what Namibia is now, it seems. So discovering of well, discovering of concept of green hydrogen, are things we must be kind of careful about, not to get excited, uh, not to think now mana is now on earth. It will take a long time first to sell. It's true it may help us to develop our country, but well, has been a curse in many countries. So since we are the last ones to get it, 
And since we are talking with those who are involved, as I've done, as equals, we hope that we are going to have a win-win situation from that. Your predecessor, President Bohamba, was quoted a while ago saying, oil is the only thing we lack in this country. You've got all the other minerals, diamond, gold, copper, and cattle, so many sheep. Um, how will oil specifically help transform the economy of Namibia? I wouldn't say oil specifically will do that. Firstly, it's not our oil. Money is going to go out to those who discovered it. We we'll have our royalties and so on. So it will not be a big thing. We had gold, as we are saying. We have diamonds. We don't see a big difference. It still goes outside in a raw form. Its value is added outside, uh, jobs created outside, technology transferred. So we hope that we have good friends we have that there must be some kind of value addition in the country. That's the only way you can say there will be more jobs created and then the money will be paid, salaries, and that way money will stay in the country. But before that, uh, we cannot celebrate. Tell us about the process of, first of all, the search for oil, and then how you settled on Total and Shell. Let me tell you uh, what I like about what happened. I am saying that we are the third wave, wave of African leaders. First wave of African leaders were those extraordinary people, Kwame, Kwame Krumah, Mse Kenyatta, those were extraordinary personalities who had kind of, we look at them as gods. Uh, they told us to wake up to free ourselves. Now, second wave of African leaders were caught up in a Cold War confusion and therefore were having coups, military coups, one party states, and so on. Not our own ideology or our own views. Third wave leaders are coming through constitutional means. Elections are the requirement. Whether elections are perfect or not, no election is perfect. But we come through elections, processes, systems, and institutions. And I will be told, yeah, but there were coups and so on, right? It is in the years. There were reversals. But when that happens, who is the one who is taking action? It's the Africans, it's the AU, it's the ECOWAS, it's SATIC. So that's why we are in charge. We want to be in charge of our own destiny by deciding and correcting our mistakes. But we are third wave African leaders who have to go through processes, systems, and institutions, and term limits also for those who are elected directly. Now, to tell you the truth, there are some people when they come to invest who like to see the president. And I tell them, don't see the president, you must see the ministers. The process of systems and institution. And I will tell you, I didn't know about even Qatar's involvement in oil search. I was told when I discovered the oil. Of course, we are a little bit uh, wary about it because we had that kind of experience in the past. We were excited that there's going to be oil and so on, and there was nothing. Mm -hmm. So we were a little bit cool, only to be told properly that there is oil. So don't get excited. I told them, don't get excited, cool it, and let's see how we're going to discuss with those who discovered oil, what will be the benefits that will accrue to Namibians from that discovery. Now, Namibia will join a long list of African countries that are oil producing mm -hmm. very soon. Um, so therefore, no, no big deal. <laughs> indeed, but again, in some of these countries, oil has not been helping much. It's been a curse, as some would like to put it. What are you doing to ensure that Namibia doesn't fall into the trap of those countries where oil has been a curse? Yeah, we'll do what we are doing with other minerals. First, transparency and accountability spells harmony. That's my article. So as I said, the proof is that it didn't go through the top, the process. It started from below. We have the ministers, inter experts actually, in charge, then ministers. So it's just not politicians deciding. Problem is when the politician will decide, it's discussed there between the investor and the politician alone, then you may have some problems. We're talking about processes, systems, and institutions. And that's going to govern it. That's going to see that there are processes, there are systems to be followed, governance systems, and then institutions, courts, and so on. Namibia is a country with a population of 
a little over 2.5 million people. What is the biggest challenge facing your country today? Biggest challenge facing Namibia is that youth, now we were oppressed by apartheid and education was not taken seriously. So we normally believe Not that taken seriously or denied? By the, by the, the people colonial, were by denied. The, by yes. the colonial, they yes. were denied, yes. they were denied, yes. So therefore, we hammered on education that kids must go to school, nobody must be out of school. So that kind of affirmative action we took creates a problem. Lack of classrooms and also crowded classrooms and so on. So that's education. But then we have now people are graduating, young people, now no employment. And when you have young people who have knowledge and who will be bored, you are sitting on a time bomb. So that's one thing. That's why we are thinking that we have to look into different ways of doing things. Like the green hydrogen issue that is now on top. It's not an immediate issue. It will be about 20 years or so on. But already you are seeing scholarships being given to, to, to our students to study the, the field. You will see that uh, we are setting up institutions already to have uh, people to discuss this hydrogen thing, but it's a long-term thing. Now oil will be the same thing too. We are going to discuss with the, those who found the oil. Why, how do they want to see we can benefit from it? And lucky enough, uh, since I'm sitting in this country, having brothers like them involved makes it easier to discuss as equals and as friends. Mm -hmm. And that will help us. Mm -hmm. Also to gain from them, from their own experience. We are talking as brothers. Indeed. Mr. President, Namibians were not only denied education by the colonialists, first the Germans and then later on the apartheid regime of South Africa. They were also denied land. Most of the land is in the hands of the white minority in Namibia. You've been carrying out a number of activities, including the land reforms, trying to buy back land and give it to the people. It's not working, is it? Well, uh, firstly, let me tell you how the five Western countries came into Namibia's independence process. When Angola and Mozambique got independence, they thought communism is one. But they decided where their kith and kin are, in Zimbabwe, Namibia, and South Africa. They must come in to kind of direct the process so that they can protect their kith and kin. So the issue of constitutional principles that they drafted were not regarding land as land. There is no mention of land in our constitution except chiefs administering their land. It was made to be a property so that the property of person cannot just be taken away from them under our constitution. So that was done that it is a property not land, and therefore it becomes a very difficult thing. And under our constitution, just to grab the land, yeah, we can. We, until today. Until today. In yes. the constitution. Yeah, constitution is our constitution. Why don't you repeal it? Why well, don't you? Well, uh, we we spare us, spare us. You have to go with time. It's true. Land per se doesn't make you rich. I have the farm. I had it for twenty years. You can sit there and starve also on that farm. We try to buy land. To resettle our people, we had done, we spent a lot of money. But if you don't train them how to use that land, it doesn't help. So the idea is to utilize the land. Or let me also ask you, if everybody is in towns, they have jobs, are they going to ask for land? If they are properly employed, they have income. It's a question of income, it's a poverty. So if you can address poverty wholesale, Maybe it will help, but land, some people are using it now as a right that to belong to my country. But how about Windhoek? There's a land of some other people too who are living there. So things have moved on. But definitely we are addressing it uh, in a proper way, where it is fair also to those whites whom we are reconciling with. We said, we made peace. We had to at war, by the way. It was a difficult situation. Mm -hmm. So we had to reconcile. Now we are telling them we have political power that we have used, that we are now reconciled at political level. 
also not only lend other businesses, you must also reconcile with us at economic level. So the second phase, we call it, our former president, Nyoma, coined it to say second phase of our struggle. That is that of really economic emancipation. But it's untenable, isn't it, Mr. President, when 90% of the population do not have access to land? You see, land doesn't solve immediately problems. President Mugabe grabbed the land. And as is the solution, the land is being returned to some of the whites. So grabbing it alone is not going to also solve the problem. So we have to do it in a way that there must be a win-win situation one day to maintain peace also. You have uh, situations where people are going to come when their kids and kids are being attacked. You saw right now what is happening. I was in uh, Brussels, NATO people were meeting that they didn't invite me or consult me. Uh, Russians were maybe having their meetings there, they didn't consult me. But today, we are being urged to condemn and so on. While ignoring us as nobodies, because we are small people. But because we fight their wars, now we want us to have a say. Why didn't they consult me? That's my point. Mm -hmm. So that's how things work in this world. So we have to do it our own way, what is going to be good for us. But some would say, I've been speaking to some Namibians who say, it's not a question of not having access to land. It is a question of, are you the right person? Because most of the political elite have got huge commercial uh, farms. So is it a matter of access rather than, you know, the situation as you're explaining it? I, I was born on a white man's farm. I could have grabbed that farm. Would you be happy with that? I bought a farm where I was born to call it my home. I could have grabbed the land. I could have instigated people to grab the land. But would we have had peace we have today? So I bought a land where I was born so that I can say I have actually it is a home. Because I'm from Senda, People who are from the north say, I'm going home to the north. So I was saying, Hake, where do you belong? That's why I had to say, let me go and buy the farm where I was born, in the area. That's what I did. So I didn't buy that farm to farm, to make profit. I said, it will be my home, where I, where I am from. That's why I bought it. And I had to buy it. I should have taken it, isn't it? But to maintain peace, I bought so that we can be fair to everybody. But if people don't also join us, those who are sitting on it, as I said, young people are not going to be like me, to have that patience. Because we know wars are not good things, we have experience. Mm -hmm. They don't have it, so they may like to experiment. Mm -hmm. So therefore it will be a different story. That's why I say do it while we are still there. Your government had um, decided to buy land off the white farmers, but it's been very difficult of late to get white farmers who are willing to sell their land. No, that, that's not the issue. It's what you do after the, the, the farm. The, the law says if you want to sell a land, they must first make a first offer to the government. And government gets a first offer, they will look at the farm, whether it's suitable for the settlement or not. And then if you can release it, that's the time they can sell it. Of course, they are trying to have the, some other ways to treat also, but the issue is education in that field, farming. We are settling people at the farms without training them, and they were failing while the land was there. So we were trying to review that process. Let's talk about um, Namibia as a country endowed with resources. It's where the desert meets um, the sea, and it's you know breathtaking beauty and tourism and all the wildlife. Um, how is tourism coming along? The last I knew was one million visitors. Any increase in the number of tourists recently? Yeah, it was 1.7, but with this enemy that came to visit us also, it went down. It's picking up now again. I'm told somebody was just reporting to me. What that. enemy is that? Yeah, this uninvited COVID-19. Yes. That's an uninvited enemy, which changed uh, 
when we are trying to plan, I think this way, I call them independent intervening variable. We had planned with these variables we had, and trying to go this way, and all of a sudden, this independent intervening variable called COVID-18, Act-19, mm -hmm. in, changed completely our trajectory. So there's been a reduction in the number of tourists coming to the country? Of course, everywhere in the world, so the tourists couldn't travel. Yeah. So obviously it went down, but I'm saying it's starting to pick up now. Yeah. Somebody was just a Nigerian who told me, I said the coast, it was full. So recently your government announced plans to export, sell through an auction, 170 elephants. Why is that? And uh, who were the elephants sold to? See, people own things properly. It's a kind of a capitalistic country. Mm -hmm. Now, if somebody has uh, elephants at their farms, they are selling it, but we don't. We control it. Our 180. I don't know where you got that figure from. It's all over. It's all over the news. Well, I, I have and, to and, say and, it. and animal protection groups are up in arms. Well, of course, President King of the in 2022 speaking to Al Jazeera, a special sit down discussing the oil and gas industry. Is it a curse or is it something that will bring major benefits for the country? <laughs> Yeah, yeah.